wall of expensive vaccines. How automated carbohydrate chemistry can save a life for one euro. Peter Seeberger, Freie Universität Berlin, Max Planck Society. On November 9th, I took my exams. I never thought the wall would fall in my lifetime. When we talk about carbohydrates, most of you will think of coffee break and maybe this. But today, I will try to explain to you that possibly with five kilograms of sugar next to me here hold the potential to save a life of three million small children that die from malaria every year. Because it turns out that carbohydrates are not just important for food. They are also, in some cases, the toxins, as in the case of malaria, that lead to morbidity and mortality. From a chemist standpoint, the building blocks of sucrose that feeds us, shown on the left side, and of a malaria toxin are very similar. Yes, the malaria toxin is somewhat more complicated, but the building blocks remain the same. And carbohydrates are important to us because they cover our cells and they carry out many of the processes in us. Heparin is a long polysaccharide chain that surrounds our cells. And if you've ever been to a hospital, you received heparin as an anticoagulant. Glycoproteins, proteins that contain sugars, are also important as red blood cell stimulants made, in, for example, as EPO for cancer patients, but also supposedly used by others. Carbohydrates determine our blood groups, and carbohydrates are important in prion disease. Now, the problem with carbohydrates is that they are very, very complex, and they show up in tiny amounts and as mixtures. So access to those carbohydrates is really difficult, and that's unfortunate because these carbohydrates are also on the outside of bacteria and many pathogens. And if you could somehow teach your immune system to recognize these very specific sugars and mount an immune response and kill those that carry them, we would have vaccines. If you have children under the age of 15 in Germany or the industrialized world, hopefully your children have gotten vaccines <clears throat> against pneumonia, against meningitis. In those cases, the pathogens, bacteria, get grown, they harvest the carbohydrates, and this carbohydrate has to be connected physically to a carrier protein, because otherwise it is not being recognized by the developing immune system of a small child under age of two. Now, the problem is that many pathogens, like my little friends here, Plasmodium falciparum, and sleeping sickness. These guys don't like to get cultured, and even less do they like to give out their carbohydrates. So it's really difficult to get access to these carbohydrates. And so one of the walls that we are facing, we started this program 12 years ago at MIT, was how can we get our hands on sugars which previously could not gotten at using either isolation or chemistry. Because if we could get access to those carbohydrates, we could open a new way to create vaccines, where we would look at a pathogen, we would think about which carbohydrate shows only up on this particular pathogen and nowhere else in the body. We would then synthesize this molecule, conjugate it together with a protein to make these so-called conjugate vaccines or candidates that get introduced into experimental animals mice or rabbits to start with, typically. These animals get then challenged with a disease you'd like to protect them from eventually. And if that works, you go towards preclinical development, which cannot be taken care of anymore at Max Planck societies or universities, but typically in spin-off companies. And the last and, of course, the most expensive step is then clinical development. In today's lecture, I will take you one example of malaria through the path towards this goal, and also show you a little bit about what we think the future holds. Now, the problem of carbohydrates is a difficult one. The structure I show you up here shows up in men on prostate cancer cells, in women on breast cancer cells. And if you can educate the immune system 
to recognize the structure and destroy it, there would in principle be the possibility of making a cancer vaccine. And people are working on this in the United States. Now, the problem is that to get to just this molecule took somewhere between a year and a year and a half. And typically, if you want to make a vaccine, you don't get it right the first time. You go through multiple, multiple stages. For that purpose, we have developed a lot of chemistry, and eventually this chemistry led to an automated instrument that allows us to assemble such a molecule like strings on a pearl necklace in 19 hours. So approximately, we have accelerated the process of assessing and accessing these types of sugars by a factor of 500. This means we have now a little plastic bead. The plastic bead sits in this machine, and on this plastic bead, as shown in the lower uh, right-hand side, we start to assemble the oligosaccharide one by one. And in 19 hours, we hold the molecule in our hands. At that stage, you start to develop. If you got it wrong, you can go back and remake, and you go through an iterative process. So what does it mean now? Carbohydrate synthesis is no longer a bottleneck. Well, that wouldn't affect too many of you, probably. But it also means for us that this is now the starting point to think about creating synthetic vaccines, not vaccines that come from isolation, but from first chemical principles. And in this case, chemistry is not bad. Biology are mixtures in those cases. Chemical is one entity. Now, malaria, I like to use as an example in this case, is transmitted by the bite of the Anopheles fly. And this one doesn't want to bite, it seems. Uh, is a communication problem? That's great. Sorry. So basically, during the bite of Anopheles fly, the mosquito transmits a parasite into a bloodstream. Once in a bloodstream, it goes into the liver. It multiplies 10,000-fold. And then comes a very, very, um, very, very critical point in the parasite. It has to enter the red cells very, very quickly. And we just recently found out it takes complex carbohydrates to do so. It bunks into the red cell, it aligns itself, it penetrates through otherwise thick wall around those red cells, and upon infection will be a total and radical change, eventually leading to a burst and death of those red cells. And it's exactly at that point where we are working with in our vaccine, where we can block um, certain processes that have nothing to do with invasion but all with death and morbidity. It was already in 1896 that Camillo Golgi proposed that a toxin should be responsible for the death of all these people suffering from malaria. In the year 2002, finally, we could show in a paper that this toxin is a carbohydrate, the one shown here. We were able to show this by combining isolation with chemical synthesis, and in 2002, the race for this vaccine approach started. Now, when we look at people that suffer from malaria in endemic areas, what we see is that the first three months, children are protected. Then parasite rates and severe disease go way up. But interestingly, after the age of two, disease goes down, but these people have still high parasite rates. Any of us would have these high parasite rates, we'd all die. But the people there seem to be at least semi-immune. I should tell you right now, there are many different kinds of approaches to vaccines, all based on proteins. And the big problem is resistance, even if they look promising early on, in many cases, resistance starts setting on. So what we want to understand is, could we somehow protect those most vulnerable, small children, from severe malaria disease by giving them the kind of immunity enjoyed by those that have grown up in those areas. For that purpose, we tested the Sierra for many people in both Afri Africa and Europe. And we could show that adult Africans have increased amounts of antibodies, proteins that recognize the carbohydrate toxin I just showed you. And that then really gives us hope that if this is working in adults, if we can confer this immunity via a vaccine into small children, they still have a parasites, but they should no longer die from a disease. 
Seven years ago, we could show that this does indeed work in animals. Early on, we could see that we could reduce um, the mortality from 100% down to 75%. We have now constructs that are 100% efficacious in mice. Now, it's very obvious we don't spend all our time and hard work in creating vaccines for mice. We want to vaccinate people. And those are, of course, the next steps. And this is a very long, time-consuming and expensive process. Early on, we tested different constructs in animals. Then a small company started to make large quantities of sugar. And that's why I brought these five kilos with me. Four and a half kilos, less than what's on here, of this GPI would be enough to vaccinate 65 million children born in Africa every year. The cost per child would be less than five euros per child. In 2006, we started to conjugate and formulate together with a large pharma partner, entered preclinical studies in 2007. The trial sites for Africa are now set, and we are now working towards going into the clinic. The cost up to this point of this project was 15 million US dollars, a lot of money. But I just looked at the numbers of people real estate bank, the German taxpayers put in 150 billion US dollars. Now, malaria is just one example. The same principle holds true for many other diseases. And currently, we are advancing all these different projects towards the clinic. Malaria is very close now. Leishmaniasis is immunogenic, goes now in protection studies. These are commercially interesting ones, hospital-acquired infections. Multiple um, compounds are now going forward. They are now being looked at for commercialization and uh, clinical development in those cases, including also fungi, which are very, very important for a large part of the world. But these are the most difficult ones to develop because they afflict people that cannot afford to pay for them. Any one of the vaccines I just showed you will cost, on average, between 300 and 500 million US dollars, one of them. The bacterial ones to use in hospitals, they're going to sell between 2 and 4 billion per year afterwards. So it won't be difficult to fund them. The malaria ones will be more difficult. And the question we should ask ourselves, is this too expensive? I was just told I have one minute left to talk. This means, since I started to speak, 45 children have died in Africa or Asia from malaria. Every 20 seconds, one. So is it too expensive? We don't think so. These are the people that work diligently and hard towards the goal of making this a reality. We are now joined by Emil Fischer, who was in Berlin. He's a great chemist over 100 years ago and through his inspiration and the really hard work of this group, we hope to break those walls. Thank you very much.